thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, my brothers and sisters and the Lord being here. Lord, I pray that you stir up that gift inside of me, God, because I know that you have a relevant word that you place inside of me for them and for me. And I pray that our ears and our eyes are open, God, to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a pencil and paper, I suggest that you get it out because you're going to learn some new things today. Amen. Amen. Good morning, saints. Morning. Good morning, teacher. <laughs> well, I'm a saint too, so. Okay. Um, about about ten or twelve years ago, the, the Lord started putting something inside of me. Um, well, I really wasn't quite sure what it was, but I knew it was something really, really big. I started feeling this burden every time I, I stepped into a church. This burden I felt was so strong and so real that every time I stepped into a church. I would become agitated or even angry. But I still couldn't quite figure out or put my a finger on what it was. I wasn't raised in the church, so I have a unique perspective on the church. It would be like looking from the outside in. So, But I have been to churches for the last 30 years because I've been a Christian for 30 years. So I've seen good churches, not so good churches, and everything in between. So slowly the Lord started to reveal what it was to me. It was a lack of knowledge in the church when it comes to knowing who we are in Him and the power we possess as believers in the living God. Let me read that again. <clears throat> it was a lack of knowledge, and that's ignorance. It's something that you don't know. It doesn't mean that you're dumb. It's just you don't know. The lack of knowledge in the church that's here in every church. When it comes to knowing who you are in Him, that's God, and the power you possess through Him in the living God. Amen? Amen. And, the and the ignorance in the body of Christ. Remember, being ignorant isn't, doesn't mean that you're dumb or stupid or whatever. It just means that you have a lack of knowledge. So there is such a lack of knowledge in the church today. You can come over here. You can come over here. There's such a lack of knowledge in the church or in the body of Christ today that it's, uh, hey brother, that I, th I think that was the, the thing that the Lord started just really putting in my heart. Every time I would literally go to a church, I, I just felt this disdain and I was like, why do I feel this? Or if I went to a church function, I, I just felt like, man, I felt agitated, agitated. It would truly be like a teacher going and teaching and putting his heart and soul into a class and then giving an exam the next day and then failing all them, the students failing all the exams. I felt that type of a burden every time I stepped into a church. But I knew it was, well, fi finally once the Lord revealed it to me, it was the ignorance inside the church and the lack of knowledge that the body of Christ should have, but it does not. It does not. So that's why I'm so excited to start a new series on the book of 1 Corinthians. This book is full of knowledge regarding the church. It deals with such issues as church doctrine, gifts of the Holy Spirit, marriage, church discipline, and the order of a church service. Church, <clears throat> church service. So we're also going to be learning some new words. So if you have a pen and a, paint, a piece of paper, let's get that out. And I'll spell them for you. So the first word I want to teach you is this. It's a phrase. It's called sola scriptura. S-O-L-A. Sola scriptura. S-C-R-I-P-T-U-R-A. Sola scriptura. Did everybody get that? Sola scriptura. It is from the Latin. Sola having the idea of a lone ground or base. So it's where you begin something, or it's the base of something. And the word scriptola means writing, or writings. So referring to scripture, sola scriptura means the scripture, or that scripture alone is authoritative, or the faith and practice of Christians. The Bible is complete, authoritative, authoritative, and true. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. Amen? Amen. So, Sola Scriptura. So, that means that this book, it stops right here. There's nothing above it, and there's nothing beneath it. It's, it ends and begins right here. Amen? Amen. Next two words 
sound very similar but are quite different. The first word is exegesis. You spell like you spell this like this. E X E G E S I S. Exegesis. The next word is eisegesis. It's spelled E I S E G E S I S. Everybody get that? They want to spell it again. Okay, so the two are com they have conflicting approaches in Bible study. Exegesis is the exploration and explanation of the text based on careful, objective analysis. That means when you study the Word of God, you do it subjectively. There's nothing on the outside. You're, you're focusing on what it says. And you analyze what it says. The word exegesis literally means to be led out. That means that the interpreter is led to the conclusions by the following text. Reading the Bible in context is key when it comes to interpretation. Well, I've taught you that's one thing I want to teach you is that in order to interpret the Bible, you have to use the Bible. Of course, you can use outside sources. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the, the Jews have such a, a, a problem with is they have something that is outside of, their, outside of the Bible, outside of the, the Old Testament. And it's basically in the interpretation of those, of those scriptures that were given by rabbis through the centuries. And they use that. And, you know, Jesus even confronted the, the Pharisees. He said, you know, you honor your traditions rather than honoring the word of God. So we don't want to do that here. Okay? What do we believe? We believe in sola scriptura. If it's in the Bible, it means that that's where it stays. You can't take anything out of it. And you can't put anything into it. And then uh, exegesis is, is, is when you read God's Word, study God's Word, and the revelation comes from God's Word. Amen? Through the power of the Holy Spirit because that's the person who wrote the Bible. So the opposite approach to Scripture is uh, exegesis. Does that, did everybody get the spelling of that? Exegesis, which is the interpretation of a passage based on a, subject, a subjective, non-analytical reading. The word uh, eisegesis literally means to lead into, which means the interpreter injects his own ideas into the text, making it mean whatever he wants. So that's picking and choosing what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say. So obviously, the exegesis does justice to the text. And the eisegesis is a mishandling of the text and often leads to a, mis to a misinterpretation. So in other words, you're putting something in there that's not there. Okay, you're picking and choosing what you want it to say or what you want. Remember, the best way to interpret God's Word is to read it in context and then, ma and then make the interpretation based on what the Bible already says. Does that make sense? Amen. So it's a mishandling of the text and it often leads to misinterpretation. Exegesis is concerned with discovering the true meaning of the text, respecting its grammar, its syntax, and settings. Eisegesis is concerned only with making a point, even at the expense of uh, the meaning of the word. You have to be very careful when you do that. We have had people uh, gone astray. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they've interpreted their own Bible. That's a no-no. It's nothing wrong with interpreting the Bible, but you have to do it the right way. But if you interpret it to make, to make it sound like something that you want, then that's exegesis. You don't want that. Or is that eisegesis or exegesis? Eisegesis. eisegesis? I get those two even confused for me. And it's the same thing with Mormons. Okay, they had, some, they had an angel that came to their leader and gave him some golden tablets. And that's why we have the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is not from God. It's probably from a God, but it's not from the God. Does everybody understand that? So the next word is called canon of Scripture. C-A-N-O-N. C-A-N-O-N. Scripture. Canon of Scripture. The word canon means standard or rule. It's actually a, a, a word that's used in law. It is a list of authoritative and inspired scriptures. Different religions have different canons. For Christians, it's the, for Christians, it's the Old and New Testaments. So it would be like having uh, bookends from Genesis to Revelation, and it stops there. So the canon is, our canon is, starts at Genesis, and it goes to Revelation. 
So you can't add anything to the book of Genesis or take anything away. You can't add anything to the book of Revelation or take anything away. And the 66 books that compile that, 39 in the old and 27 in the new, is where we stop. We don't add anything to that and we don't take anything away from that. It stops right there. Rebuke the spirit of slumber in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So the Bible, in those 66 books, contains everything that we need to know to live a righteous life. Everything that God wanted us to know is in those books. Amen? Because that's what the Bible is. It's a book that is compiled with other books. Right? So we have two or more trains of thought in the church today. One is, we only have the Bible and nothing else. And when the canon of Scripture was closed... All the miracles and supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit stopped. That's one rule. That's one way of thinking. Okay? The other is we must be led by the move of the Holy Spirit. Even if we're doing it out of order, it seems to be a God thing. We've seen that recently, especially in, in some of the, the, the so-called moves of the Holy Spirit that we see. Uh... Things are happening. People are running around like dogs, you know, with their and chickens with their heads cut off, and and then they're speaking in these languages, and they're doing all these things, and they're saying it's a move of God, but there's no scriptural basis for it. If it is not in God's word, the Bible says to this, to do this. It says, test the spirits, mm-hmm. test the spirits, amen. If you don't see it in scripture, it isn't there. But fortunately for us, we know that when there are moves of God, you can look in the Bible and see how they go. Why? Because God is a God of order. We're going to read that a little bit later on. Okay? God doesn't want things done out of order. Do you like things out of order? No. Because it, it, it causes chaos. God is not a God of chaos or confusion. He is a God of order. Amen? Amen. So we have to be careful. The Bible tells us how to do these things and how a church service should function. Amen? And, and, uh, and uh, so, it, so it's great to be led by the Spirit, but if it's not backed up by the, by the Scripture, then it's not necessarily of God. So the biggest issue I've had with the church today is balance. We just don't have balance in the church. Some church denominations use uh, exegesis when it comes to their views and, mis- and uh, misinterpretation of Scripture. Believing and claiming sola scriptura. They have the correct interpretation of scripture. And still the same applies when it comes to other views. My way or the highway. Okay. One of, the, one of those denominations believe that once the, once the apostles died, um, the signs, the miracles, and the wonders stopped. Okay. But that is not a correct interpretation of the Bible. I rebuke a spirit of slumber in this room. In the name of Jesus, wake up. God wants to show you something. Okay, so we have to be careful. It has to be balanced. And there's some views that are so opposite of that. You know, the people running around like crazy and doing all these crazy things. No, don't get me wrong. God's asked me to do some crazy things. But I know it was Him. It wasn't me. And I want to be obedient to those things. They may look crazy to people, and I'm fine with that. You can think I'm crazy. But I'd rather be a fool in God's eyes than a fool in man's eyes. Excuse me, I'd rather be a fool in man's eyes than a fool in God's eyes. See? <laughs> Got to get that right. I know, man. Okay? But if it's a God thing, it is truly a God thing, but it's always led by the Bible. You have to have a balance. Because I guarantee you, if you've ever been... Raise your hand if God's ever healed you. Okay, everybody in this room is raising their hand. Okay, why? Because you know what the Word of God says. That healing is for today. Jesus went to the cross and paid the, and shed his blood and paid the price for us. Why? So we could be healed. He was bruised for our transgressions and wounded for our iniquities. And our, the peace, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. Amen. That applies throughout all the generations. That doesn't stop when the Bible stops. Okay? That doesn't stop here. The Bible says this. It says when the perfect comes, there's not, we're going to read this later. Uh, as we get along in the text, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But no, this is applicable for today. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He doesn't change. He doesn't shift like shadows. He's the same always and forever. Amen? Amen. 
So when we look at Scripture, we first must know what it says and believe what it says. No more ignorance in the, in the house of God. Just imagine what the church would be like if believers started, to wa started walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just imagine with the signs and the wonders following them. Yet, we're, yet we're, if we were grounded in the Word of God, the devil could not even get in your heads. Do you know that? If we started walking in the power of the Holy Ghost with the signs and the miracles following us, just like it says in Mark chapter 16, yet we were grounded in the Word of God. We knew what the Word of God said. The devil, there's no way the devil could even get in your head. Why? Because you would recognize him and kick him out. Amen? Amen. But, but we are ignorant of the Bible. We're ignorant of who we are, and that's the point. That's the burden that God has put in me. Ten or twelve years ago, He started birthing this thing in me, and, I, and like I said, I would go into a church service, and I would be angry. And I'm like, what is, why? I'm supposed to be happy, Lord. I'm supposed to have joy right now. But I saw this ignorance, and slowly He started showing me that it is, I'm one of the people that He wants to, don't, I don't want to sound weird, you know, because I know he's because I know that he's doing this to other ministers. But it'd be like going to boot camp. What happens at boot camp? The drill instructor does something to the cadet. They break them down. They break all their selfishness down. They break all their uh, all the all the issues they came in with, and then they build them back up and they prepare them for battle. That's my job to prepare you for battle, yeah. to prepare you for war. Why? Because I believe God's given me this word. At this time for you. And there will be yelling. And there will be probably some screaming. But you know what guys. I'm gonna, I am going to be led by the spirit. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And you know what. Because you, I, he is raising up an army. I said that last week. And that army is you. That army is me. You don't ever want to go into battle unprepared. Amen. Right. Before they give a, a soldier a weapon. They teach him to use the weapon. They don't put it in his hand and say go to war. They say this is the way you use it. They, they, they take apart the weapon. They put the weapon back together. They, they, they can do all sorts of crazy stuff with that weapon if they have to in order to get it on the battlefield to conduct war. Amen? Yes, God has won the, 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 he's won the fight. When Jesus went to the cross, the Bible says that he got the keys back to the kingdom. But the issue is, is there's still a battle going on. Amen? Why? Because there's people out in the world that do not know Jesus. And it is up to us to give them the gospel. God doesn't want you going out into that battlefield. If you jacked up here, if you're messed up here, He wants to fix you and get you out there. And don't get me wrong, some of us still need some fixing. But God is so gracious and so good that He will let us to go out on the battlefield with the issues too. Amen? Because we all have some issues, don't we? So just imagine what the church would be like if we walked in the power of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So do you think that God stopped that in the first century and said, hey, this is just for them? No. When Peter got up, in the, and you read in the second book of Acts, he read from the Old Testament out of the book of Joel. Because there were people there that thought that when, when the power of the Spirit came on these men, 120 people got saved. And there were people from other countries there that heard them speaking in the language that they the country that they came from. And they thought, you know what? Man, it's kind of it's kind of early to be drunk. And Peter stepped out and said, do not suppose that these men are drunk like you think because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He said, what you're witnessing right now is what the, the prophet Joel spoke about. He said, in the last days, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Amen? And guess what? As far as I know, we're in the last days. So what makes you think that God is going to stop doing something that he started 2,000 years ago. I'm telling you this. The beginning is here. The beginning is now. Get ready because He's coming back. But don't only get ready because He's coming back. You have work to do. And you can't do it if you're not equipped. So today is, and from this point, it's time to get equipped. It's time to get armed. It's time to get ready. God wants to use you. Don't think He does it. He does. I know He does. And guess what? He's brought me here to help you. Amen? Amen? So get ready. So do you see why I'm so passionate about this? Let's start looking at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Corinthians chapter 1. So remember as we read along and get into more chapters, 
we will see the church in Corinth was a troubled church. They had some issues. This church has some issues. The church across the street has some issues. The church down the road has some issues. Amen? Amen. Every church has issues. Why? Because they're governed by men. Because men are involved. Amen? Amen. So, so it was a troubled church. One of the things that they, that they did is they tolerated sin. Confusion in the church services were the order of the day. Okay? So they had, they had ignorant people in that church. There's no doubt about that. So with that in mind, let's look at what, or how Paul addresses the people that he writes a letter to. Okay, Paul is writing a letter to this church. Now the thing about Corinth was it was a huge city. And, it, and it, at, at, at this point, it's going through a renaissance. Um, it, was, it, had, it had an awesome port. In a, in, uh, it was a Greek city. And I believe it was 40 to 50 miles from Athens. Athens is the capital of Greece. Yet Corinth is much bigger at this point than Athens. Okay? Now remember what the Greeks did. The Greeks worshipped idols. The Greeks did some crazy sexual weird stuff. Okay? They did some stupid weird stuff. Okay? So the mindsets of, the mindset of these, of these Christians who were probably Jews converted to Christians. And then the, the Gentiles started converting to, to, to Christianity. God had to do something with them. Why? Because they were so used to a pagan lifestyle that God had to deliver them out of that pagan lifestyle. And some of us are no different. When, I, when God came into my life, I did, I had, he wasn't even in, the, in my program. He wasn't even in my thought process. I wasn't even planning to go to him. But he found me. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that. It's not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. Amen. Amen. Listen to what Paul says. So with that in mind, think about this. There were some issues in this church. There were some people doing some wicked things inside the church. And this is how Paul addresses them. He says, Paul called an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. And Sotheus, our brother, to God's church in Corinth. To God's church in Corinth. To those who are sanctified. Everybody say sanctified. 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 sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints. With all those every, in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both theirs, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So this is one of the main reasons, or not the main reasons, when I refer to you in the morning, I say, hello, saints. Now remember, the backdrop here is what? That there were some issues in the church, yet Paul still calls them out as saints. Each one of you in those chairs has issues. I have issues. Yet God sees me as well as he sees you as a saint. Amen? Amen. So Paul is fully aware of all the issues in the church, yet he still refers to the people in the church as saints. And he refers to them as God sees them and sees you. I'm not calling you saints because I think you're saintly. I'm calling you saints because God thinks you're saintly. Let me repeat that. I'm not calling you saints because I think you're saintly. I know everybody in this room pretty well. You know me pretty well. And I can say, I don't think I'm a saint. You probably don't think you're a saint. But this is God's perspective, not mine. Amen. 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 So we got a lot of saints in this room because that's the way God sees you. If you only knew, or if you, only, if you, only, if you know Jesus, uh, if you know Jesus and have, and have called on His name for salvation, you have been sanctified and set apart from this world. That's what sanctification means. That you have been pulled out. Amen. You've separated. God has separated you from the world. Amen. Amen. If we had any idea how much the Father loves us. Sin, worry, self-doubt, depression would, would be a non-existence in the church today. Yet we have it and it's here and it's alive and well. Those things. Amen. Amen. But if you had any grasp of the love that the Father has for you, those things would not exist in this church or any church. But again, we fall back and we rely on ignorance. 
Most of us are unwilling to crack the Bible up. Yes, this is my job. This is what God's called me to do. Yet every day I have to replenish my soul. Every day I have to refresh my soul. Every day I need spiritual drink and spiritual bread. Every single day. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Yes, I've been called to pastor or preach. But every day. Why? Because I'm a Christian first. Amen? Amen. And every one of us, we have to get in this word to know what, it's, to know what it says. Okay, because there's people out there that know what it says, but they're misinterpreting it. And we are, not, we are not able to stand when they come with their misinterpretations because of our ignorance. That's a no-no that we shame on us. Amen? Amen? So here's some verses people take out of context or have a complete misunderstanding of who we are in Christ. Listen to this. This is back in 1 Corinthians uh, verse 4. It says, I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ. That by Him you are enriched in everything. People have misinterpreted, misinterpreted that, that verse as we can get wealth because God has enriched us. The Bible talks about that, about men going out and preaching the gospel for money. Shame, 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 shame. Should never be. Okay, but if you read it in context, that by Him you were enriched in everything, in all speech and all knowledge. Okay, when you see all speech and all knowledge, what does that mean? This is referring to you. Come on now. All speech and all knowledge. Some of you are scared to talk about Jesus because of your speech. I don't know if I can speak in front of people. But here, if you read it, that God has enriched us in everything, in all speech, in all knowledge. What is knowledge? It means you have an understanding of something. You get it. You snap to it. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. We have no excuse when it comes to, to, to giving the Word of God to anybody. We shouldn't fear when God puts a person in front of us or people in front of us and say, I don't think I can do it. I don't know if I can do I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I've been studied enough. Trust me, if, if you are willing for God to move in you, to speak through you, He will. You say, well, Pastor Don, I don't... You say, well, you know what? Look at what Jesus said. He said, there's coming an hour and a time where you're going to be put in front of people that basically can take your life and you're going to be asked to give an account for what you have to say, for what you believe. And he said, don't worry at that time what you're going to speak or what's going to come out of your mouth. He said, at that exact hour, he goes, that will be me speaking yeah, through yeah, you. Yeah. He says, don't worry about what to say. He said, why? Because it won't be you speaking. It'll be me, yeah. my spirit speaking through you. The key there is to yield yourself to God's will, to be obedient, to be fully aware. When, again, and I keep harping on this, when you go to work, it's not to work. When you go to play, it's not just to play. Every, on Sundays we play basketball. I don't. I, yeah, I go out there to have fun and get in shape, and that's great. But ultimately, we take people that don't necessarily go to church, or people who are just making their way into church. I want them to see Jesus in me. Amen. Amen. I am very competitive. I love to. I just. It's not so much the winning. I just. It's the winning. <laughs> Amen. You always feel good when you win. Amen. You know. But, but my, primarily, my primary objective when we go out and play is to make disciples of all men. Amen. Why? Because if they see God's character in me, they're going to think, wow, I usually go to the court. And I, I, you know what? I let them cuss. I don't, whatever, I don't care. Go do what you do. That's the way I want you. Amen? Amen. We fish for them and God cleans them. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, there's, so you have no excuse. Just imagine, we're all guilty of it. Just imagine when you go to heaven and God shows you the line of people that you had an opportunity to minister to, yet you did you balked on it. You balked on it. You know what the word balk means? That's a, that's, a, that's a baseball term. You hesitate. You hesitate. A pitcher, when he's standing on the mound, he's got, he has to have one foot on that. There's like a, like a plate there. It's like a, I don't know, it's like a hash mark. And he, has to, and he has to, when he does his wind-up, he has to do it a certain way. And if he gets to, the, to a certain point, he can't hesitate. 
If there's a runner on the base and he does that and he hesitates, the, that base runner gets to go to another base because he balked, he hesitated. It has to be one fluid motion. It has to be a follow through, okay? And some of us aren't following through with what God's called us to do. Hey, amen? amen? But guess what? If you know what the scripture says, what does it say? So that you do not lack any spiritual gift. Any spiritual gift. Oh, excuse me. Let me read six. It says in this, in this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift. Everybody say any spiritual gift. Any spiritual gift. Any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord. Okay, now that's where the misinterpretation comes in. Let me read it again. I'm sorry to verse 5. It says that by him, by who? Yeah. By him. Who is him? Jesus. By Jesus. Amen. By him you were enriched in everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. In all speech and knowledge. Okay, so we get those out of the way. So if you say everything, what does that mean? That means everything. everything. Why are Christians living like we don't have anything? When God says, I've given you everything. Amen. Amen. And I'm not just speaking about this. Come on now, I'm not speaking about this. I'm speaking about this and about this. Amen. Amen. Imagine the testimony that you have. My testimony is this. When I graduated high school, I couldn't read or write. And look at right, but look at me now. I'm a teacher. Yes. Is God good? Yes. Hallelujah. God yes. is good. But that's just like God, isn't it? Because He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Amen? So I always think... Uh, hold on. In all speech and knowledge, in this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. Why? Because of what He did. You have a testimony now. That Christ exists. Why? Because He confirmed it in your salvation. So that you do not lack any spiritual gift. Okay? If the spiritual gifts, uh, if the spiritual gifts um, stopped with the canon of Scripture, we should take that Scripture out. Why? Because He says, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift. One of the things that they say that the, why the, the spiritual gifts have, have ceased is because we don't need them anymore. Why? Because we have the Bible. We have the canon of the Bible, just like I was saying earlier. That can't be true. That can't be true because the context in which these things are written, the progressive, they keep going. They don't stop. He didn't say once the, once the, once the Bible comes, then it stops, it ceases. There's, the word ceases and it isn't in there. Okay? It says he doesn't want us to lack in any spiritual gifts. So you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the revelation? Him coming back. Okay. He's already been revealed once. How's he been revealed once? When he came as a man, he died on the cross. What did he do? He went to heaven. And he said, the same way I'm going to leave, I'm going to come back. There's, there's a, where he was standing when he left was on, the, was on the Mount of Olives. Where he preached the Beatitudes. Okay, this says this in the Old Testament. It says this. It says, talking about Jesus, that when He comes back and stands at His second coming, the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Okay? So the same way He left, He will also come back. That's the revelation. There's nothing new. There's no new revelation. This is it. That He's going to come back. But until then, He has given us everything that we need in the supernatural. Does, you understand what that means? Okay? And that's what I want you to get. These spiritual gifts are relevant for today. How do I know that? How do you think it's, you have the ability to speak to somebody unless it's God speaking through you and it's not you? That's a, that's a spiritual gift. That's a supernatural thing. Do you understand that? So we've got to get it in our minds that these things haven't stopped or quit existing. They're relevant for today. Okay? And you know what? When you look at the generation today, what, what do you see? You see this. Okay? And they're constantly looking, constantly searching for something new to inspire them. Okay? They're, they're always looking for, for things that, that, they, they, that, that are going to motivate them. Okay? And if we come up to them and say, well, you know, the Bible says you need to dress a certain way, and you need to look a certain way, and you need to act a certain way, they're going to say, delete. They're going to delete you. 
And they're going to delete everything that you have to say. But if you come to them with the power of the living God behind you and one of their friends gets killed and you walk over there as a Bible believing, born again, spirit filled Christian and you lay your hands on them the way the Bible says that you should do and they get raised from the dead, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to delete this and say, I want to know what you know. I want to have what you have. Show it to me. And then you speak through the power of God's word. But you can't do that in a dead church. You can't do that with dead words. The Bible is, God is the living God. He is not the dead God, but the living God. And it's time that Christians do what? Begin to live again. Okay, you see, you see what I'm saying? That's where, that's where this is going. Well, I don't serve a dead God. I serve the God of the living we can't misinterpret what he says. How, how, it's like a slap in the face of God. Well, I, I just, you know, I can't believe that. I just can't believe that. So God's saying, you can't believe what I said? Come on. So you don't want to lack in any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to what? To the end. When is the end? Is the end now? No. Is the end when you die? No. That's the beginning. The end is when he comes back and he breathes out of his mouth destruction on the enemy. Imagine that. When he comes back and the devil's there with all of his armies prepared to do battle with us and we're riding behind him and Jesus speaks to word and says it's the breath of his mouth and the devil's annihilated. Just like that. You have that power in you too. Right. And it's time we start walking in that power. Yes. It's called the resurrection power. Amen. Who killed Jesus? The Romans, the Jews, or you? Nobody. He said, no man takes my life. He said, I lay it down willingly. And he said, if I lay it down, he said, I will certainly take it back up again. The man raised himself from the dead. How many people you know did that? Just one. <laughs> Just him. Amen? Amen. And that same resurrection power that raised him from the dead. We sing a song. That same power lives in you. Do not let the devil lie to you and tell you that you, are, you don't have it. He's the liar. You have truth in you. He's the liar. Amen? Amen? Amen. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of of our Lord Jesus Christ when He comes back. Amen? Amen? God is faithful. You were called by Him into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Guys, we've got to understand something. That God wants us to get it. God wants us to understand it. And we have to do it. Because if we don't, what happens to ignorant people? They get run over. Amen? Amen? A professor is no smarter than you. Why? Because God says that He's given you everything that you need in speech and in knowledge. Amen? Amen? Don't let a man or a woman tell you you were something that God did not say that you were. The only thing and the only person that has any relevance on who you are is this book and what it says about you. And as far as I can tell, everything I've ever read is true in that book. I've never read anything that wasn't true. I may not feel like I'm a saint. I may not act like a saint. But that's not what that says. It doesn't say on the days that you feel like a saint, I guess I'll call you a saint. The days that you look like a saint, I guess I'll call you a saint. Guess what a, guess what a, a saint looks like? Look in that mirror. Look in that mirror. That's what a saint looks like. It looks like you. And it looks like me. But it's time that we have got to start walking and acting and talking like we are sons and daughters of a king. Not son and daughters of hell anymore. Because that's not who we are. Amen? Amen? But you can't do that without God's power. And you certainly can't do that without God's will. So if you know what the Word says, you interpret what the Word says correctly. The Bible says to, do, to rightly divide the Word of truth. If you can do those things, you are going to walk in the power and anointing that God has placed on your life. And it's time to start doing that. We're not all there, so I'm not saying that. 
Remember, you've got to be broken down and then be built, then be built back up. Why? Because your mentality needs to change. Your mindset needs to change. Amen? Because the devil has some of you so confused and so messed up in the head that when you wake up in the morning, you don't know who you are. Come on, and it's true. I've been there. I can't tell you something I haven't experienced. But when you know God's Word and you speak God's Word over your life and you get into God's Word and you find out what it says about you, when you wake up, He's the confused one. Dr. Tony Evans said this in one of his books. One of his books. He said that when a man or woman of God wakes up and their feet hit the floor, the devil goes, oh crap, they're awake. That's what the devil should say when you wake up and your feet hit the floor. Oh no! I've got to go through this again. A sold out, born again believer who knows who he is, knows who she is, and they're walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's going to be a long day for me. You're right, it is, devil. It's going to be a long day for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters, God. Lord, I shake off anything on them that was not brought in here, that was not of you. And Father, I pray that we know that we know that we know that we, we what your word says about us, who we are, and the things that we can do, God. May we not misinterpret what your word says, God, but may we stand on the finality and the truth of it, God. Lord, you are a God of the living, not a God of the dead. So I thank you, Lord, that you are alive in all of us, God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that they walk under this influence, under this anointing, under this power of the resurrection of the living King. The Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, the Lord will make His face to shine upon you, and the Lord will give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.